And if you'd turn with me to 2 Corinthians 6, and also Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. And while you're turning there, I want to remind you, everything's going your way today. You got an extra hour of sleep. I was going to teach the whole chapter, and at like 6 o'clock this morning, the Lord's like, no, you're going to cut that in half. And so instead of a three-hour message through all of chapter 6, we're going to teach, and no, no, I'm just joking. Uh, if anybody needs a Bible, shoot your hand up. Love to have you follow along. Making our way verse by verse through the book of 2 Corinthians. And let me remind us once again that when we're reading through 2 Corinthians, what we're reading is correspondence between the Apostle Paul and this first century church in Corinth, Greece. And because it was just written correspondence, Paul to the Corinthians, he didn't write chapters and verses in there, and now moving on to my next, it's not like his, they were his bullet points, he was just writing them a letter, and it's helpful for us to, to find our place so that I can say, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and Ephesians chapter 4, and we know where we're going and how to get there, but this was a letter, and so chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians begins right where chapter 5 le- left off, and so In chapter 5, Paul had said, just to set some context again, he had said that if if we have been reconciled to God, then we're no longer God's enemies. Instead, we're new creations in Christ. And then he says, if that's the case, if that's taken place, if we've been reconciled, if we're no longer enemies, if we're new creations, then we have been given a ministry, a ministry of reconciliation. And now let's look at Ephesians 4.11. And then we're going we're gonna to head back to chapter 6. But I want to look at Ephesians 4, verse 11 and 12. It's just a little bit to your right if you're not there yet. 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Gentiles, eat pork chops. Great way for you to remember that. You're welcome. Ephesians 4, verse 11, says, He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor and teachers. For the equipping of the saints, that's you. For the work of the ministry, for edifying of the body of Christ. Let me read that again. Here's these, these lists of ministries, these lists of, uh, of God-given titles here, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers. And he said there, for the equipping of the saints, that's you for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. As pastor teacher, my job is to equip and edify you with God's word. That's that's what I'm called to do. And and with that, those who have been new created, we're new creations, we've been reconciled to God. God has committed to each one this ministry for each of us. It's not just for pastors or elders or or ministry leaders or anything like that, but every single one of us, if you're sitting here this morning and hear the sound of my voice, if you're a new creation, you have a ministry. And and now you have this ministry of reconciliation. And we're, as he says in chapter 5, back to 2 Corinthians 5, we have this ministry as as ambassadors and and representatives. and, uh, and, And we tell the world you don't have to be at war. We, we, we are, that's how we're born in sin. We're born in enmity with God, his enemies. But we tell the world, you don't have to live that way anymore. There's, you can be reconciled to God. And so our message is, is 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. And now these chapters, as I said, they flow right together. Paul continues to explain this calling, this ministry that every single one of us has on our life. Not only are we ambassadors for the Lord, he said we're workers with them. He says, we then, as workers together with him, we're reconcilers and ambassadors, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In an acceptable time, I've heard you, and in the day of salvation, I've helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, as we dig in here, his plea, Paul's plea to the Corinthian church in verse 1 here is not to receive the grace of God in vain. That's an interesting thought. 
that God's grace can be received in vain. Vain means empty. It means without substance. To take the Lord's name in vain means to use it without meaning behind it. You're just throwing it out there like, a, like, it, like, it's, like it's profane, like it's common, as we said before, like it's not holy. We're not giving it value. Grace means getting what we don't deserve. And so there's a sense here to, to receive the grace of God in vain. There's a sense in which he is speaking about salvation. If we put it off, we're just going to deal with it later, and it's not really a priority. Like the time that Paul spoke to Felix. He was on trial before Felix in Acts 24. And, and Felix was very interested in the gospel. He really had perked his interest. But he said to Paul, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I'll call for you. And in that way, it's grace in vain because there is this sense of urgency that today needs to be the day of salvation because tomorrow isn't promised to any one of us. The Bible says that our lives are are like a vapor. Hebrews chapter 3 says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the day of rebellion. And so if you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, this is the portion, portion of the message that's for you. Everything else is going to be for believers, those who are called into this ministry of reconciliation. But if you are not in a relationship with Jesus, today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. You're not promised one more day. Don't wait till you're 18 or graduated from college and you had a little fun or when you're married. Let today be that day. Don't have this grace of you hearing the message, how God made him who knew no sin to be sin for you, that you might have the righteousness of God in him. Don't let that go by without accepting it. That's the grace. But what he's really speaking to primarily here is those who have been saved. He's writing to the church in Corinth, and the grace that they or we are in danger of receiving in vain is grace that is not only received, but it's not being worked out in our lives in ministry. Because we're all called to the ministry. Now, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15.10, if you take notes or you write in your Bible, I'd jot that down right here. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15.10. He says, the grace of God, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me, Paul says, was not in vain. It wasn't without substance or use. Paul said, that didn't happen to me. But he says, instead, I labored more abundantly than they all, than than other ministers. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was within me. And so Paul's plea to the, the church in Corinth and the church in Ellensburg is that not that God would help us in what we're doing. Come on, God, let's go. Let's, you can hop on. We've we got some ministry ideas and some programs we're going to do. But that, but that we would work with him, that we would work with God. And so to be a new creation, to have this reconciliation worked in us, and to not be an ambassador, to not be ministering in reconciliation with those that God's placed around you, That's to receive the grace of God in vain. To just, I'm saved, but I'm not going to tell you how to be saved. I'm not going to let you learn how to be reconciled to God. And so, I don't have a slide for this, but the title of my message is Workers with God. We're working with God. But we could say, here's an extra one. There's going to be more slides later, but there's an extra one, a freebie. Slide one could say, Workers with God are ministers in grace. Paul wants us to receive this ministry of working in grace, through grace, by grace. And so he reminds us, number two, if you're taking notes, not only are we ministers in grace, workers with God minister with a sense of urgency. Minister with a sense of urgency. In verse 2, Paul references Isaiah 49 and, and showing us this prophecy that was written hundreds of years before Jesus was born about his, the Messiah, Jesus Christ's ministry of reconciliation, is now, Paul says, in this day, in the, in the church age, in the day that we're living in, now it's fulfilled and extended, that ministry of the Messiah is extended to us, the church Now is the accepted time. Behold, now, twice he says now, is the day of salvation. It is the acceptable time for us to be working for the Lord. 
it's not acceptable. Let's say let's, that if it's, not, it's the acceptable time to be working for the Lord, then what's not acceptable? It's not acceptable to kick back and take it easy and not care about people who are not going to heaven. That's not acceptable. But now is the time. Now it's acceptable to get busy and work with the Lord. Ephesians 5.16 says we are to redeem the time for the days are evil. Now is the time. Now is the day. If we call on the name of Jesus, now is the time to get busy, to receive this grace and to put it into work in the lives of, of wherever the Lord has us. Jesus had this same sense of urgency. If you remember in John chapter 4, after speaking with the woman at the well, and uh, she, you know, she had went, and all these men came back. And, like, she went, and she, she testified, right? She received this grace, and she passed it on. And then this whole group of, of men came back. And, and as they s- saw this group coming back to where Jesus and the disciples were, Jesus said to them, Do not say, there's still four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they're already white for the harvest. There's already a harvest field out there. And so what Paul is saying, we can't put this off. We can't have it be a secondary thing. There's an urgency that the Lord is calling us to partner with him in ministry. Now is the time to serve him and share that message. And I'll tell you what, is sometimes we misunderstand maybe what the mission field is, but just listen to this. In 2004, the Barna survey indicated that 63% of people who refer to themselves as born-again Christians made this decision to follow the Lord before the age of 13. That's the mission field. Yeah, maybe it's these guys that have heard from someone else that are adults, but 63% in our world, it's kids, it's children. We have to be urgent about this. And so this is, this is part of the ministry that we have, that we're partnering with the Lord in. It's reaching these kids. You know, we, we put on a great VBS every year. We'll put on another one. A hundred kids have come the last couple of years that hear the gospel. We have this harvesting event on Halloween, and, uh, and this is how we get a partner with the Lord. We play games with kids. We hand kids candy. We share the message of the gospel with kids, and 10 children responded to the altar call that night. Yeah, amen. This is what we get to partner with the Lord in. And so not only is working with God by grace, with urgency, number three, it's marked by integrity. Look at verse three. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. Because there's this importance and this urgency from our calling with God to reach others, Paul says, We have a responsibility to protect this because the message is so valuable. We don't don't want to give someone an excuse to, he says here, to blame it, to have it be blamed. If you have a different translation, that that word, it means to be discredited or dishonored. There's a lot of ways today, I don't need to even tell you, that ministries can be discredited and dishonored. Selfishness, hypocrisy, insincerity, greed, the list goes on and on in which ministries can be blamed and discredited. But we can't allow those things because we have this important ministry, because we partner with the Lord and there's this urgency to it. We can't let anything into our lives or into our ministry that is going to give people a reason not to respond to the gospel. We can't give people a reason. We just can't set it out there. The enemy's doing enough stuff. He doesn't need our help to keep people from the message of the gospel. And so Paul, he made an effort to live what he preached at, at all times. And he knew that uh, his, the message itself might offend, but he doesn't want anything in the way that he presents the message to offend. He knows the gospel is offensive. He told us all about that in 1 Corinthians. You're a sinner that needs to be saved. People are offended by that. But Paul himself was not doing anything to offend. There's grace, urgency, integrity. Number four, workers with God minister with endurance. Now, beginning at verse 4, this is a pretty interesting section. You know, the, the, the whole book of 2 Corinthians is, is Paul unveiled. It's his most personal, intimate. He's expressing things about himself. And beginning in verse 4, Paul paints a picture of the ministry, but it's not 
a Bob Ross type of painting. How many guys like Bob Ross, right? Love Bob Ross. Friend of Charities went as dressed up as Bob Ross for Halloween. Great idea. But Bob Ross, you know, his happy little trees and all this. Uh, Paul painting his picture of the ministry doesn't say we're going to have some happy little outreaches and, and, and trials. Uh, they're not really trials. They're just, you know, happy little tribulations that we're just going to get through and it's going to be fine. He says, here's a glimpse. Here's an honest look into my ministry, this ministry that I'm protecting above everything else with integrity. He says, in all things, all things is all things. In all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of, the, of God in much patience and tribulations and needs and distresses and stripes and imprisonments and tumults and labor, sleeplessness and fastings. This is not what we'd, ex, we'd expect. This is not what we would advertise if we're trying to promote people to get involved in partnering with God in ministry. Well, let me tell you about it. You know, a little brochure about your seminary or Bible college. Well, here's what you can expect. And Paul, he's not like... Uh, maybe, you know, my dad had a tendency to do this to a point, and maybe your dad did too, but, you know, the dad that had to walk to school both ways, uphill in the snow, you know, like somehow it's this topographical anomaly that it's uphill both ways. But Paul isn't like that. He's not saying, this is what ministry looks like, so you better toughen up, kid, if you're going to get involved, because life is miserable. You better get used to it and enjoy it. Paul's not saying that. He's showing us that this ministry that we're called to, and we are called to it, it's not glamorous, but it's worth doing well, and it's worth sacrificing for. It's worth enduring for. He says, we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience. And uh, a better word, perhaps, would be endurance here, perseverance. It's, it's an active, that word describes an active strength under pressure. We think of patience as just like, sitting there gritting our teeth, waiting for time to pass. But that's not exactly what Paul has in mind, you know. Um, or maybe patience is, you know, waiting while your wife goes shoe shopping, you know, or, or something, and like, oh, I'm being so patient, sitting here, waiting for her. Can't believe how patient I am. But it's, <laughs> it's actively going through a trial triumphantly, more like, I know you found eight pairs of shoes that were the wrong color black, but what about this black pair of shoes? Maybe this is the one. There's a, there's a triumphal endurance found in it. Wait, honey, wait until you see these shoes. But far more than shoe shopping that Paul is describing, Paul lists nine trials that he endured in ministry. The patience is how, the endurance is how he dealt with them, but he faced three different categories here. We could say there's general difficulties of life, tribulations. The word means afflictions, pressures. Second, he lists need. It's hardships, discomfort, pain. Third, distresses. Literally, it means like narrow, tight spots where you don't know where to turn. You're just, you just, I don't know. I've tried everything. We're just, oh, it's just so frustrating. I don't know what to do. There's just, just distresses. So there's general difficulties in life. Then he faced external challenges. Fourth, he says stripes. Later in the, book of, uh, in the book, Paul's going to tell us that he was whipped five times with a whip and then beaten with rods three times. Eight times he was beaten. Fourth, or I think fifth, he says, I, in, in jail time, I, I've, I've spent time behind bars. This isn't a reality for us, but it's a reality for much of the Christian world today. That, that's still a possibility. That's the world they live in. Sixth, he says, tumults. Really, it's like, it's like riots or mobs. It's like Black Friday gone wrong, you know, where everybody is turning against you. You have the only TV, and now it's worse than that. But Paul's saying all this happens. And then he says, not only are there these general difficulties in life and these external challenges, he says, I even put myself through private disciplines. Seventh, he says, labors. <laughs> I work hard. The ministry is worth working hard for, so I work hard. Eighth, sleeplessness. Ninth, fastings. I'm burning the candle at both ends. I'm skipping meals. I'm doing what I have to do, anything that I have to do to advance the cause of the gospel. I'm going to do it because I, that's more important than my well-being. Now, we probably, these nine trials, we're not going to face all these different trials. Uh, very few trials are the same, but trials always require endurance. Even the trials that you're facing right now, 
requires endurance to go through. But notice he endured because he was equipped. Number five, workers with God are equipped. After he lists this, I love this sort of thing, he lists nine trials in ministry that he's endured. He now lists nine resources, nine ways in which the Lord worked in his life in the midst of those trials that helped him endure. He says, by purity, or you know, we could maybe say sincerity, without hypocrisy, just, hey, this is how I got through this. Yeah, it's just a, a sincere, man, I didn't, I didn't have mixed motives or any of that. By knowledge. He understands what God's purposes are and what the enemy's intent is. That helps him get through trials and difficulties. By long suffering. It means putting up, in the most literal sense, putting up with hard people. Putting up with difficult people. Anybody have a difficult people in their life? Don't answer that. <laughs> By kindness. Regardless of how he was treated, he responded with kindness. And then I think the key to this whole list, by the Holy Spirit. Really, all of this is fruit of the Spirit working in, 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 in his life. By sincere love. Where does agape? It's selfless love, the highest form of love. By the word of truth. How do, how do you get through that? How do you endure? I understand what the book says. I understand what truth is. This isn't a secondary thing to my Christianity. It's part of what gets me through the trial. By the power of God. God met him when he, found, when he was at the bottom of his barrel. You know, at the end of his rope, that's where, where God came. When he had given all, when there was nothing left. It's, it's Ephesians 6, you know. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. It's not me and my own strength. It's what God has done in his strength. By the armor of of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. He understood this is a spiritual battle. And I'm, I'm dealing with real people, but this is a spiritual battle. And so he took up the armor of God. And, and when it says left and right, uh, most commentators say that this is an, an offensive uh, and a defensive. You know, he's got, he got the shield of faith and he's also got the sword of the spirit. You know, I'm, I'm, I can deal with these trials because I've I'm I'm got both things going on. And so... Workers with God are equipped. There's these great challenges, these tribulations that, and he lists off for him, it's imprisonment and torture and all that. But there's a great answer to those challenges. And I think one of the, um, one of the things that we do is, is we focus on the trials and not the resources that we have. But Paul, he's got nine and nine, man. There's a resource to meet every, every single trial that I'm facing. And it's not, I'm pretty sure it's not that Paul just, you know, tightened his jaw and like, oh my God, I'll show you if it kills me. His endurance came from dependency on the Holy Spirit. All these things, they're, they're fruit. They're, it's the ministry of the Spirit working out in his life. And so that when he's jailed in the book of Acts, when he's imprisoned, he can respond with kindness. He can, when he's jailed, he can endure that thing. When he's, because of the spirit working in his life, when he's jailed, he can serenade the other prisoners at midnight, you know, him and Silas singing away. That's only the spirit. That's not him saying, I'm just going to try really hard. Now let's sing a song, Silas. No, man, the spirit is just working in him. It's real. I'm in jail. I'm in prison. But God met me even there. And I'm going to praise him for it. No matter what our challenges, we have these same resources available to us. Now, verse 8, Paul goes on to describe the incredible ups and downs in ministry, this paradox that the worker of God deals with. Because sometimes, you know, people get the idea, and I hear these jokes all the time, and I know most of the time it's a, it's a joke, but uh, you only work one hour a week, you know, those sort of things. And sometimes people, that's what they think ministry is, that it's a cakewalk. But listen to Paul's synopsis of ministry. Verse 8, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold, we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Workers with God 
are mis, number six, are misunderstood by men, but known by God. This ministry thing, and just to clear it up, I work more than an hour a week, okay? I teach on Wednesdays too, so it's two hours <laughs> a week. But this ministry thing is just, there's a back and forthness to it, and my wife will attest to that. Highs and lows. One day, my God can move a mountain. Next day, oh God, I'm scared. Where are you right now? I need you to show up for me so bad. This is where Paul lived. This is where the worker with God lives. Balancing the here and now that we're in with our future eternity. Balancing the promises of God with the frailty of humanity. Now, it's been said that if you want to find gratitude, the best place to look is in the dictionary. But Paul looked to the Lord. And so he was dishonored. We just go through this whole list. He was dishonored before men, stoned, eight times beaten, you know, with whips and rods and all that. But he also knew, even though I'm feeling that and I'm dishonored and spat upon and rocks thrown at me, I'm dishonored by men, I also know that I'm honored before God. I'm serving holy, righteous, sovereign king of all creation. And he knew that people would say some vile things about him and to him, maybe say he's brainwashed. Who knows, you know, the things that Paul dealt with that people said about him. But he also was living to hear Jesus say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the kingdom. He knew that he wasn't making it rich. He wasn't in the ministry to get wealthy, support himself, making tents. I'm not wealthy here, but I am storing up a treasure. There's just, just these paradoxes that are all over in the life of a follower of Jesus and someone that is a worker with God. Now, to come full circle, I was going to finish the chapter, but please come back next week. I'm super excited about next week, too. Super excited about that. And you're looking ahead as like, you're excited about being unequally yoked and all that? Yeah, I am. Come back next week. But to come full circle here, workers with God, Paul is pleading with us. I want to come back to verse 1. Paul's pleading with you, with me. If you're saved, if you're a new creation, if you've been reconciled to God, Paul says, don't receive that grace in vain. Be working for the Lord. All of us, every single one of us, you don't have to wait until you're perfect. It'll never happen. God's used perfect people one time. One time has he used a perfect person. Just join with him now. We're imperfect people. We're common people with a holy calling. Working with God to save, to to change people's eternal destination. It is a unique privilege to work with God. It is grace. It is a grace to to serve in the children's ministry, to to teach your kids at home, to to work with the youth, to to greet at the door, to work with student athletes. Man, there's so much ministry in this room. It's grace. It's God's goodness that we don't deserve, that we get to be a part of. And it's grace because he doesn't need us for it. He doesn't need Tad Skeffer to stand up in front of a group of people. But he wants to. He wants to use you. He wants to use me. It's like when, you're, when your kids are younger, you know, they want to help you with something. They want to help you wash the car. Or, oh, yeah, sure. I'll wash it when you're done washing it, you know. I remember when Kenya was little, I'd be, it wasn't even a self-propelled mower, you know, but I would, either she would hold a little tiny bar down here, you know, or she had her own little Fisher Price lawnmower. And so I'm pushing, mowing the lawn, holding her hand as she's pushing this Fisher Price thing. It was a blessing to her, but I didn't need it, but it was a blessing to me too. It was a blessing for me to have that relationship with her. And just skip down. I'm not going to teach the rest of the chapter, but, but look at verse 18. I can't wait to get this promise. That's why I, can't, I want you to come back next week. Verse 18 says, I will be a father to you. You shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord 
Almighty. It's a blessing to participate with our Father, even if He doesn't need that. And so, it's a grace. It's a grace. Of all the places there are in the entire world, just kind of picture a globe, of all the time that there's ever been since Christ was resurrected until this moment, combine those things, all that time, all those places, God has for you right now, right here, to participate in this grace at, the, at your job, at the college, with your family. Right now, we have this grace, this ministry of grace that we can participate in. Amen? Let's pray.